Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, let's get into this. So now we're going to do part two of the May homework, and that consists of the full pro forma underwriting. So in the previous video, we just went through the year one acquisition or the year one after acquisition, sorry. And we kind of built out the beginning of our value play. So now we're actually going to go fill out this big guy and figure out what is this deal going to look like overall, right? So let's just say, first of all, I want to say I'm going to hold this for maybe five years, right? So we'd like to be able to sell this thing in five years from now. Uh, so if I hit five in this cell, that's going to all of a sudden unhide five of these cells and show me a five year period, which by the way, you can change this to whatever you want. It'll update all the stuff for you. So five years is where we want to start. Exit cap rate. Let's go back and look at what we're buying this thing at. Mm, 7.2. In place based on our numbers. So I never want to assume the cap rate is going to get better. Um, I think I can probably sell it at a better cap rate than it was, but um, we're, we're talking about market cap rate here. So <clears throat> the way this works is, as I mentioned in a previous video, in the sale year, it's going to go calculate projected sale value once we get to this point using. Um, the net operating income and this cap rate that we give it. So this is actually what market cap rate do I think I'm going to be able to sell this thing at? Let's just say that it's going to stay about the same, right? I mean, you could make an assumption that the market's going to be worse when you sell it, which might be good if you're at the top of the market. You could be in an emerging market and you say, well, gee, I'm buying it at an A cap rate, but you know, I'm in a path of progress and I know there's like, 15,000 jobs coming from Boeing or whatever it is. And I know in three or four years, you know, as well as I can know, cap rates probably gonna be a little bit better, but we're just going to say we're selling it at the same 7.2 that it's at right now. So 7.2 exit cap. We can change that later. Sale commission, usually 2% transfer tax, 2%. That's, that's going to debit your sale later. Income increase. Let's just go with a standard 3% increase on rents and 2% increase on expenses. You'll notice our interest only period and stuff comes in here. <clears throat> Let's make sure everything's populated. It did good. So now we only have a few more cells to fill out before our pro form is complete. I'll, don't let the red scare you. That's just because we haven't put stuff in yet, but red is negative. Black is positive. So let me go back and look at what we had started to build out on our pro forma here a few minutes ago. So we had said we were going to do this a third per year. Let's just copy this and take it over here. Uh, put it right here. <clears throat> so we had said that we were going to do a third of the units per year. Um, and we're going to add to the previous number. Okay. So this number will move down to here because this was, we were adding to the year before that. We're still going to do $140 rent bump times a third of the units. And I am going to go just steal this and grab the 228 from there. So that's going to continue our value play in increasing. And I'm going to drag it over one more time, except I know I need to lock this cell. Dollar signs lock sales, by the way, so that I can prevent it from moving on me. Um, so now if I drag this over one more year, by now we will have completed over three years, the turns, a third of the units per year. And then from there, I'm just going to assume that the rents go up. So do this times one plus the 3% we talked about. Let me do function F4 to lock that cell, or you can just type in dollar signs. That prevents it from moving as I drag it. So as I drag this over, you'll see that means that it's going to increase by another 3% over this year. See what, see what happened. That dollar sign has prevented that from moving for those of you who don't play in Excel as much as I do. Um, Okay, now I'm going to just hide that so we have more screen space here. <clears throat> vacancy loss. So we said that during a turn, you're probably going to have higher vacancy than you would in stabilized mode. 
Um, so I'm going to start stepping this down. Let's, let's say we decided 10% was a good number for physical vacancy. This is physical vacancy, bodies in units, right? Oh, that's bad. Um, people in units, people, tenants, not bodies. Um, okay, so let's say we kept it at 10 for this year, but then once we have two thirds of the unit done, I'm going to think we're going to have a better tenant base and we're going to start, you know, getting quicker at things. Maybe we actually step it down to a 7%. And then by the time everything has been turned and has full, you know, new tenants in it, we're going to say that I'm down at a good 5%. You know, 5% is usually a pretty well-run property. I, I could fill it up if market demand was that high, but as you, if you're pushing rents, you're probably going to run an effective 5% vacancy probably. Um, so that calculates our vacancy loss for us. Concessions and non-payment. Let's go back and look at that. So we're effectively at 4% right now of concessions and non-payment, which by the way, physical vacancy and, you know, concessions and non-payment, you add those together, that's your economic vacancy. So this property going in, we're about 14% economic vacant, um, borderline not stabilized, depending who you talk to. So let's say we're going to keep improving we improved this over the first year, if you recall, from um, 112 down to 80,000. And I let's say we did some math behind that. So let's go ahead and drop it another, you know, percent or so. We'll say down to like 3% in this year. I'm going to say I get down to 2% here. And I'm going to run pretty lean on this at one, you know, you're usually going to have about 1% on a well run property. So, so, okay, we pretty much have our entire utility um, reimbursement. How do I, so, sorry, we have our concessions and non-payment, our income. It's going to calculate our net rental income, which is the sum of all this. And now we need to do the utility reimbursement and other income. So if we go back and look at utility, what have we done here? What have we done? Okay, so we went ahead and instilled the full 90%. Uh, versus our um, utility bill. <clears throat> okay, so that's going to stay the same and other income is going to stay the same. So um, I'm not going to assume other income grows with the 3%. I could, but nah, it's not necessary. Um, so these are going to stay the same. Okay. Now, the last thing we have to do before we have a fully baked pro forma here that we can check out is see what's going on below. So by the way, you see a very strong income improvement over our 1.837. You're going to 1.92, 2.0, 2.2, 2.3. It's very good. Pro tip, when you start to figure out that you're, you know, you're, you're going to have sharper increases in these first couple of years as you're forcing rents to go up, right? Uh, but then once you get into that 3%, you know, or three to four, whatever you'd assume in your market, it, it, you're going to have your sharp spike and it's going to level off. And I bet you, if you watch your returns, which I'll show you down below, they're going to be increasing at a decreasing rate. So that, that's how you start to make the decision on when is it appropriate to sell after I've hit my returns I need, I could theoretically hold it and just keep making money. But at some point you got to think about the velocity of money and do I want to roll that into something else? Um, so anyway, pro tip there. <clears throat> Taxes, we said in, so let's say we bought this this year. So 2020, 2021, 2022. So taxes are going to be the same this year. Okay. Just because in Tennessee, we should be getting a reassessment going into effect in 2022. Um, now, I don't remember how old this property was and how long people owned it. Um, actually, if you bear with me, I think I can find exactly this answer. Let me go look back in my files here. Um, bear with me because in the deals, we have something we actually lost. And this was Tennessee. We would have had underwriting for, um, No, I've got this in here. That's the underwriting reports, LOI, best and final offer. Let's go take a look at this. And this would have been 
the Hermitage. I'm actually curious now. You're going to get to go back in memory lane with me for a second. What had I actually offered here? So, okay, it looks like on this property, I was actually going at it on 12 and a half million. I'd increased my bid a little bit. I wasn't happy about it. Now, taxes, by the way, this is the underwriting report that's generated from the, the software that I use um, called Commercial Underwriter. It's got a lot of bells and whistles and it's pretty sophisticated, but what we have here works just as well. Um, okay. Okay, we were going to get a hefty tax increase here. So we'll just go with that 138.230. And I'm not going to explain why this is the way it is. There's something I have to do to fool it into this. But um, I do want to check one more thing real quick. If we go into financial summary. Yeah, here we go. This is what we want. Hermitage Financials. So this had been done taxes. Here we go. So yes, okay. So the actual number was gonna be 5480, and in 2023 is when this was gonna be, sorry, 148028. So we're gonna X out of that. And your number will be 148028. Okay. And then it will remain the same from there on out. Okay. Let's get rid of all the old stuff that I had here. So that's a, I mean, this, this is, you can see this really bites people. If you don't know to watch your tax bill, especially in a state like Tennessee, where you may not even have any idea for two or three years down the road, and then all of a sudden you get hit with a $100,000 tax increase in one year, that can break a deal. That can, that can put you into very dire cash situation. So always important to make sure you're understanding how this part is calculated. So anyway, the rest of this is really just, you know, all of this is based on your takeover underwriting. And then we have, um, this is being increased by your 2% expense increase automatically for you. So just watch those numbers. If I increase that to 3%, it's going to change all those numbers for me. So this is a real quick, easy way to get a pretty standard cost of doing business increase, right? Now, if we go down and look, we have, you can see our net operating income is increasing every year. Our capital reserves are still the same as they were on the first tab. Excuse me. Uh, primary debt service. We said we had two years of interest only. So you see that manifesting itself here for year one and two, and then it flips to principal and interest automatically for you. Uh, secondary debt service would do the same thing if we had any, but we're not using it. Total cash flow. Your company keeping 30%. That's the amount of money we would be deducting from total cash flow for you and keeping for equity partners here. And then going into, you know, calculating the actual cash on cash return your equity partners would see, you know, starting in year one, we're going to be seeing that 8.7%, uh, gradually going up to 10.4. You're going to see a little, little dip in that in, uh, year three because your, your debt is going from interest only to principal and interest. So that's not too out of the ordinary, but you make that up right after that as you finish your value play. Now, this is where we start figuring out how to calculate the total return. And ooh, I'm going to need to fix that. I didn't realize I had a, a um, formatting error. So I'll take care of that here in a moment. But the projected sale value, this is using the net operating income in the sale year and your um, exit cap rate. So you can kind of see what it's doing there. Now, this is kind of slick. Based on your loan, your loan um, payments, this is going to aggregate for you. How much of your loan do you have left at the end of each year? Because as soon as you get that check, you're going to have to first pay off the loan before you give anybody any money, right? So it's important to know our first two years of interest only, we didn't pay anything on the loan. We, we or no principal rather. We just paid interest. It wasn't until year three, we started knocking out, you know, principal. Um, then we have our commissions and transfer tax taken out. And now we have our net gain and loss from sale. Okay. 
Now we have to figure out what total money have we distributed today? Well, we have net gain loss from sale, and then we also have total cash flow before taxes to date. Now this is effectively adding up the total cash flow in each year. So for example, if you look in the, in the sale year, uh, that number adds up to 3.2 million. That's exactly what's right here. So this is just showing all the cash you've distributed to date in the year you sell it, right? Projected total returns. Now we're going to start looking at this and saying, okay, well, what is my, you know, when does it make sense to sell? When have I hit the returns that I need to for the investors? Well, this is a pretty strong deal because what we're showing here is we could actually hit the annualized return of 20%, which remember 20% per year for five years is a hundred percent. That means you double your money in five years. That's, that's very strong. We're surpassing that very quickly. So honestly, this would be a property if you really could get it at 12 million, which I, I don't think I could because let's, let's actually go up our price a little bit. Cause as, as I remember, I actually had to bid, um, 12.5 is in the file we just saw and I actually lost. So let's say it was 12.5 was my strike because I didn't go any beyond that. Let's say 13 million was the actual price here. So let's say that we, you actually went beyond me and you're the guy who outbid me on the property. Now, if I look at these returns again, still in pretty good shape. Okay. Clearly I gave too much credit for the actual rents we could bump this to because I would not have lost this deal if that was the case. But anyway, um, this is showing that your equity multiple, which is basically, you know, an equity multiple of two means you basically double your money, right? So this is showing 1.55 in that year. Um, total annualized return of 31%. Now you start looking at the, equity partner distributions because you need to break it from total distributions into what your equity partners are going to receive. Now this is going to be according to their equity split. Same thing with the cash. So the, this, these numbers should be smaller than your total returns up here. Um, and we did a 70, 30 split. So remember that now before you calculate their return, you need to figure out what their overall gain loss to date is. And that's going to be including giving their money back um their initial equity infusion so it looks like no matter how good i do i can't really um can't sell it this early because we wouldn't be able to make any money yet i'm sorry i'm reading here yeah okay so in year three, we actually, after we finish our value play, this makes more sense. We have enough room to sell the property and give some money back. Four and five, the numbers get better. So for the equity partners, this is calculating the same returns instead of the total returns. Let's look at the equity partner returns. And this is going to be showing that, okay, if I sold it in year three, I know investors are going to be happy with 8% return. But here in 14 to 15%, that's okay. I'll give you that. I mean, I held it for five years. I didn't quite double the investor's money, but that's a pretty good return. So let's say we do want to sell it in five years. And then that's what's decided. And then I can go over here and say in that fifth year, by the time all said and done, my company, who has run the property and executed on this value play, not to mention you know, getting the, the reputation for having delivered on a property like this. Now you have put in your team's pocket $3.6 million um, and paid the investors um, a total of about 3.7. It looks like after you give their money back, you would have paid them a total of about 8.4, but giving their money back, they would net about 3.7. So you wind up coming out about as good as they did. Difference is you put in the work and the investors got to reap the benefits, but they gave you the money. So pay them first. Um, all right. Well, that's kind of how the overall um, pro forma works. I'll fix this before you guys get your hands on it so that the <laughs> formatting works better. But um, yeah, talk soon.